Welcome to Human Factors Cast, your weekly podcast for all things human factors, psychology, and design. Today is October 13th. It's Friday the 13th, 2017, and you're listening to our fourth is that our fourth and final Human Factors Cast HFES bonus episode? I'm live from HFES in Austin, Texas, and I'm your host, Nick Rome, joined today by my good friend and yours, Mr. Blake Arnsdorf. What's up, Nick? Happy Friday 13th and last day of HFES. Yes, yes, it is a last day of HFES. Uh, I actually went to more stuff today than I did yesterday, which is funny enough. <laughs> That's awesome, man. Well, how do you feel ending up the conference? I mean, has it been a good week over uh, overall it has been a good week overall um i lots of networking lots of good presentations from all the folks here at hfes um and uh good job by all the presenters here like they they just they, they knocked it out of the park this year i think epic man so tell me about today what did you end up going to see what sessions you go to panels so the opening uh, plenary session I went to was uh, Jim G, and he did a thing on uh, he did a talk on gamification, and it was really interesting. The kind of perspective that he took was, you know, game gamification traditionally is you take those trivial parts of video games and kind of make uh, connectivity a little bit more extrinsically um, rewarding, right? So you take it's addictive but not interesting so to speak. And, uh, you know, he, he kind of broke it down in terms of there's the big G game, which is the social interactions. You have the little G game, which is the software side of things. And you have the affinity space and the affinity space is where he spent the majority of his talk on. Now this is sort of these multiple places where you have shared affinity. Um, and this could be anything from like, um, you know, a modding community or a journalist community. Like it, the affinity space is basically where a bunch of people come together to try to solve a problem. And he sort of gave Dota 2 as an example, right? So you have the design space where you have like the tutorials, uh, a library of terms, guides, those are all designed. But then you also have things that are designed for the emergent, which are things like coaching, and uh, being a spectator or um, trying to min-max hero builds. And then you also have these emergent features, which are things like Twitch or theory crafting um, or the forums where you can kind of go and discuss this. And all this together is this affinity space. Gotcha. So it's like a, a combination of both like physical and virtual worlds where you're having to figure out the ins and outs of, in this case, a game. But I think this is also analogous to what, I, what I've been doing, and I think part of what we want to eventually do in our own Slack channel is I've been taking a lot of web development courses where it's like they have the video element of how you go through the course, the projects you're going to make, things like that. But then Slack is really where you're getting to interact with a lot of all the different students, the actual professors TAs where you actually share information and learn a lot more about like in, in my case the backside of JavaScript or anything like that so this is a really cool concept but how did it how did the gamification part really play into um, being applied other places outside of just games so he he didn't make so much of a point on gamification but it he, his point was that we do gamify things but we should be designing things to be more accommodating towards these affinity spaces we should try to affinity ties uh what is the term he used uh affinity spacification he said is what we should be aiming to do with these things and it's one thing to kind of apply this to dota 2 where it's a video game but how can we apply this to real world problems um and you know in dota 2 you have this well-designed mentoring experience you have facts that are used as tools to solve problems you have alternative solutions and copious amounts of actionable feedback there's a lot of different factors that play into how this community is doing this right you have learning and assessment every failure is an opportunity to learn and uh, if video games are not about passing, but rather mastery of them. And it's all these attributes that he was trying to say, we need to apply these to real world problems, such as the climate change issue or 
um, the education system. And he kind of gave this, along with the education system, he kind of gave this example of Alex, who is a 15-year-old girl. And, you know, she's comprised of, he said, about 12 ethnic groups. But she wanted to write vampire fan fiction, kind of akin to the Twilight series, right? And, um, you know, her first pass at this was something that was heavily plagiarized from... um, Oh, what's the author of the Twilight series? That that woman, and um, you know, had a lot of spelling errors. And if she was in school, if she submitted this as a paper in school, she'd be sent straight to the principal. She wouldn't have there'd be no recourse for her actions. But if she was on a website, someone might say that's a great start, but don't plagiarize, and your spelling is a little off. And here's some resources that you might be able to get. Here's some helpful websites. Um, you know, and and eventually, what she ended up doing. This is a real case study. She made this final product where she uses The Sims, uh, the video game The Sims, to make a graphic novel. Right. So she has over she has thousands of readers on this thing to help. Um, you know, people her age kind of relate to the things they're going through, and. In the process of doing this, I mean, she's learned how to create a website. She's learned how to master the Sims. She's learned how to take feedback from other people. She's learned how to do tutorials, manage contacts, uh, use Photoshop for these things. Like, this is an important 21st century tool set that in school she would have gotten punished for doing something like the plagiarism in the first place, right? So learned a lot of skills, can use a lot of tools. You know, it was just very interesting to kind of see this this problem applied to this space, right? So if you can think about something like, um, he, he put up all these factors about, you know, here's, here's another one of these spaces, and I bet you don't realize what it is, and it's billionaires trying to use this space to hide dollars outside of the United States to get avoid taxes. Um, you can apply this problem to the dark web. They have a whole community that is devoted to commit identity theft and then you also have you know bad people are typically single-minded and they're very focused and because of that it's easy for them to build these communities and so why don't we do this for good is his whole message yeah and it's i don't know this hits on a lot of different topics right because the funny part about the story with the 15 year old girl is like she she did something that especially i mean in the academic community we know we get heavily in trouble for which is the plagiarism part but it all started with her being inspired by a piece of literature enough to basically copy what the author had done, but it led down this road of learning so many skills and becoming, it sounds like, a better writer in a more create in a more creative way, too, like incorporating video games, Photoshop, the internet in and of itself. And I think part of the affinity space problem is developing a community around what you're trying to learn or what you're doing or i think that's the biggest benefit here is like not only did she learn a bunch of skills but she's got i guess this community that now bolsters her up and i mean you can even make that analogy to the dark web problem right like you've got somebody that's totally focused on in this case identity theft but they they find other people that are interested in the same thing and build it up from there so, I mean, I, I think there's a lot of utility. It's just like um, like the author of the presentation is talking about. It's the application. Yeah, so that was the opening session. Um, I also got to kind of jump around a little bit between a couple of sessions. Um, and I got some interesting things to talk about. Not too much. It was a Friday. Everyone was kind of wanting to go home. And speaking of which, we can't make this too long because I got a plane to catch here. But... What I will say is that I did see uh, a couple things on um, automation. So there was a uh, panel on railroad automation where they were looking at, you know, how different types of automation affects, um, you know, safety and fuel consumption as it pertains to the operator, right? So the big takeaways from this one was that they didn't notice a system change when the automation was doing something different. And uh, there was no mode awareness in terms of the displays and uh, distractions negate the, or have it had a negative impact when the train was automated and then there was a distraction and then uh, it actually caused more damage than not having a distraction. I'm not doing this paper justice, but uh, it was really interesting to hear about the, the, 
the train domain because I'm not very familiar with it at all. And again, it's this was kind of my cleanup um, attempt to bring our listeners something that's not just VR, right? <laughs> we had no VR sessions today, so it was it was a uh, kind of an attempt to reach out and grab some things that may be new and different. Yeah, and I think that line of thinking that they're going for in the research, I mean, it makes sense in terms of introducing automation to something like a train or rail system, that if you, if you're, because I'm assuming you're taking operators pretty much farther out of the loop than normal, so if a distraction occurs, now it's trying to jump back into that in-the-loop thinking and understand what the automation did, so I could totally see how they would find that automation in this case might produce something worse. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, so let's get into uh, driver takeover in, oh, you know what this was? This was what happens when you anthropomorph, wow, what happens when you anthropomorphize uh, automation? And how does that affect drivers in a semi-autonomous vehicle? Ooh, that's interesting. So what did the paper come up with? Well, before I get into that, this was actually done by a couple of my former colleagues. So I just want to shout out to Michelle Hester because this was her kind of baby. And this is one of the reasons why I went to this panel. Um, but they, they, uh, there's this whole issue of trust in automation, right? So does anthropomorphize? Wow, I'm going to mess that word up. A lot, guys. So can anthropomorphize, can doing that to automation help in situation awareness and trust? And the bottom line is yes, but it's just an initial study, so we'll see what happens. But the, the interesting thing about this was the unique perspective towards how to anthropomorphize. Uh, they basically did uh, task-relevant they made the computer say task relevant things they made the computer say task irrelevant things and then there was like a chime for warnings and then there was no warning right so the task relevant thing would be something like the vehicle ahead is slowing down it'd be like alexa or cortana or google home telling you the car ahead is slowing down and then you have something where um Task irrelevant would be, isn't it a beautiful day, right? And just to kind of give the AI some sort of personality um, versus a chime, which would just be ding, there's something going on that you should pay attention to and no uh, no feedback at all. So yeah, it was, uh, it was really interesting. So, so what they found was that, yeah, if you do provide some task relevant stuff, it's going to improve performance. But there was a lot of, man, this is irritating. Uh, that they reported. So it, it, we'll see. We'll see where it goes. Uh, so it's an interesting line of thinking here because, of course, if you make something a little more human-like or you're anthropomorphizing, um, in this case, kind of an AI talking to you, it's going to help you kind of understand it a little more, feel maybe a little bit more comfortable because I definitely have seen this over time as improvements have been made to different types of virtual assistants that I interact with, like Siri. Like I feel like I can rely on it more the better that the technology has gotten and the more human-like it is. So I could see that from giving you giving people driving more a more of like a better situation awareness based on the kind of voice they're hearing and the information it's giving makes a lot of sense. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Um, I'm going to move on to these next two just really quick. Cause like I said, got a plane to catch. So we'll get through these and then uh, that'll be it for our HFES 2017 coverage. Um, so this uh, one of these ones, I was done by a former advisor of mine and uh, he did it on uh, falling risk as it pertains to um, human factor safety, right? So how can you mitigate uh, falling risk and prevent uh, injuries, right? And and basically, they found that there's an overestimation of distance when you look over the side of a railing, and that's the same whether or not you have uh, a solid wall, a railing, or uh, no railing. And you know, it, it it all comes down to understanding sort of uh, the, oh, wow, I mixed like two of them together here. Hang on. What was I trying to say? There's a focus on the environment, right? And and uh, they all estimated in, in all of them. And that was the major takeaway of that one. I'm going to I'm gonna keep moving here. Um, the uh, safe design of mining equipment, mining equipment, they basically just showed a couple examples of iterative design on a 
a way to board one of these mining, um, um, I don't know, they're, they're the caterpillars that push mud. I don't know what they're called. I'm not a, uh, I don't know. But um, yeah, they, they're, they're looking into how to iteratively sort of design solutions. Now, there were a couple other presentations like on cranes and, and uh, drilling in this session that kind of followed the same format. But uh, just know that there was a coverage of a variety of different domains. Um, you know, and, and one thing that we kind of talked about on the show a couple weeks ago, I believe there was an article about how AI and uh, computers can, can sense when um, a human is within a robot's operating area and then slow down or, or move to avoid the human. I believe we had a story like that. And uh, there was a paper on that at HFES. Oh, that's awesome! Yeah, because we were we had a story basically about kind of what we talked about with um, Logan last night. It was basically the robot arms that they put in industrial manufacturing plants and being able to sense if there's a human coming in the in the way or in the radius that they could be hurt. So that's that's pretty cool. What yeah. was the paper about? So it was basically uh, they called them cobots, which are collaborative robots. Uh, versus process robots, right? And how do you manage this residual risk that happens when you are operating with one of these guys, right? They're not necessarily plug and play, even though the distributors say they are, right? So there's these these crushing zones, these cut edges, there's collisions with the cobot. Um, so the solution is basically these safety light curtains that when it detects a presence within these safety curtains, it will do a variety of things like slow the robot down or, um, you know, uh, stop it altogether or something, something along those lines. But I, I thought it was really interesting and tied in really nicely with uh, some of the other stories that we have on the show. Yeah, actually, this particular instance really ties in, and I think it was last week we talked about this. I, I'm a little confused because we've done so many podcasts this week that if it was this week, forgive me, guys. But we talked a little bit about how I think it's Intel has launched basically an SDK for the Internet of Things that's for free. And I feel like the information from studies like these as far as what really needs to be thought about or put into uh, the Internet, installation of collaborative robots like like these safety curtains or um any kind of parameters like that could help inform you know what is in an sdk like uh like the one created by intel so that the when these robots are bought or put into manufacturing plants they are a little bit more plug and play than they are right now good well uh you know what man this the internet problem and the fact that i gotta catch a plane means That's it for today, everyone. (laughs) What did you guys think of all of our HFBS 2017 coverage? Did you like it? Did you hate us? Did you hate us? Did you hate it? (laughs) I don't know, man. (laughs) Write in. Let us know. You can follow us all over social media. Head on over to the Human Factors Cast LinkedIn, Facebook, or Twitter at H Factors Podcast. You can join the discussion on our SoundCloud or send us an email at humanfactorscast at gmail.com. We're also hanging out on Slack, so uh, I'm going to try to post some of those proceedings there so you can uh, find out some of the articles that we talked about on the show this week. You can leave us a voicemail at 901-646-1432. That's 901-646-1HFC. If you like what we're doing, you can support us on our Patreon, patreon.com slash humanfactorscast. Be sure to like, subscribe, review us on Apple Podcasts, the Google Play Store, or whatever your favorite podcast directory is, and make them good. And of course, you can always reach us at our home on the web. That's humanfactorscast.com. Mr. Blake Arnsdorf, thank you so much for dealing with my technical issues and being the real MVP this week for guest producing uh, all of our content. Where can our listeners find you if they want to know how to produce a podcast? Oh, you guys can always find me on Twitter at Don't Panic UX. You can also catch me in our Slack. Uh, find that on humanfactorscast.com. Nick, thank you so much for doing this all week. I think this has been a lot of utility for our listeners, the community, and HFES in general. So thanks for a great set of episodes. All right, man. Well, I will see you Monday. And as for me, I've been your host, Nick Rome. You can find me on LinkedIn or Twitter at Nick underscore Rome. Thanks again, guys, for tuning into Human Factors Cast all this week. And until, I guess, Monday, it depends. It depends. It depends. Blake, I'm so tired. I got a plane to catch. <laughs> <laughs>